The Bitter Side of Sweet, Chapter 18 Next day, each of us is exhausted. It takes all our energy to drag ourselves to our feet and move around Daula. For a while, we wander aimlessly along the main road Omar was taking yesterday. When Saidu declares he's hungry, I can't think of anything else we should be doing, so I lead them to a spot out of the way of traffic and sit down. Khadijah takes the hard-boiled eggs and fruit we saved from dinner and splits them between us. We need to get some more food, she sighs around a mouthful of egg. I agree, but I'm not sure how we're going to get it. I still have the handful of money we stole from the boss's house in my pocket, but it's not much, and I'm no good at haggling. At home, it was always the girls who went to market to haggle, but I'm not sure Khadijah knows how to do that. Have you ever been to a market, I ask? Of course I've been to a market, she answers huffily. No, no, I mean, did you do the shopping at home? I correct myself. Khadijah looks away. Well, no, not really, she admits. I usually only went to the market if I needed school supplies or clothes or shoes or gifts or something. Wait, you went to school? Saidu asks. There's an awkward pause. I remember that Saidu was asleep last night when Khadijah told me her story. Khadijah isn't Malian, I tell him. She's Ivorian and grew up in the city. We're helping her get home so her mama can get a good doctor for you and help us get home to Molly. You're like the bosses? He gasps. That had been my first thought, too. No, Saidu, she says earnestly. I just grew up in the same country as them but that doesn't make me like them. Sadu's eyes are stormy as he processes all this. And you went to school, he says flatly. Yes, she says. Don't be mad, Sadu. School's not that bad. I think you'd like it, actually. You're a smart little boy. Sadu gets distracted considering his possible smartness, but I haven't forgotten our real problem. Did your mother do the shopping then, I ask? trying to picture what Khadijah's mother looks like. No, she says, and from the way she's not meeting my eyes, I can tell she's embarrassed by something. Well, then who? I'm baffled. She said she didn't live with, a, with her father. Does she have sisters she never mentioned? An aunt? The maid. Khadijah's answer is so quiet I can barely hear her. I stare at her blankly, not having any image to go with the world she lived in. You had a maid? Saidu bursts out. How rich are you? Khadijah looks down at her hands and the silence stretches. Finally, she whispers, Please don't hate me. And I just shake my head because I don't know how I feel about her life and her world and her school and her reading and her maid for crying out loud. But still, I don't hate her. Anything else? asks Saidu dryly. She looks up at him, a question in her face. Is there anything else you want to tell us? Can you fly? Are you a princess? Khadijah bursts out laughing. No, Saidu, that's it. My mama's a journalist and I grew up in Abidjan. That's all of my secrets. Well, okay then, he says. So, I sigh, looking at Khadijah, you're not really going to be much help in a market, are you? I can do it says Saidu, surprising us. We both turn to look at him. What? I can go to the market and get us some food. I used to tag along with Auntie when she would go shopping for us at home. I don't miss the emphasis, but I also think it's a terrible idea. My blank stare must have been an, an answer enough. I can help. You never let me help. What? Some woman walking on the other side of the street with plastic jugs on their heads turn and stare at us, eyes lingering on Sadu's missing arm and the machete at my waist. I lower my voice a bit. There's no way I'm letting you wander off without us. You're still sick. You always think I shouldn't help, he argues, but I can. When you were chained, I kept up with the other boys and brought you food. I can help. You just never let me. Yeah, and look what happened to you when I wasn't there. The words are out of my mouth before I can stop them. I never meant to throw his injury in his face like that. 
but at the same time, it's the truth. I can do this, Amadou, Sadu whispers miserably. Let me help. I stare at him. His ribs stand out like fingers against the thin fabric of the boss's shirt when he breathes. His right hand trembles slightly by his side, and his face is covered with a fine sweat, showing how much energy this fight is costing him. His other arm ends in a dirty bandage that I know we need to change soon. He is small and breakable. I want to hug him and make everything go away. And yet his eyes are fierce, and I can't deny that what he says has some truth in it. I take a very slow, very deep breath and reconsider all the things I was about to say. I remember Khadija insisting in the truck that Seydu needs to be able to do some things for himself. I know his arm's not coming back, but maybe if I let him do more, we can get him to be whole again on the inside. Okay, I mumble, pulling him against me and resting my face on his head. Okay. Sadu's body goes slack in surprise. Then I'm getting the breath squeezed out of me. Thank you, Amadou, he mumbles into my shirt. I glance at Khadija. Her eyebrows are high on her oval, oval face, and her mouth hangs open a little. She looks like she's about to say something that might make me feel uncomfortable, so I push Sadu away and rub my hand over his hair. Don't thank me, I say. I'm just too lazy to do it myself. What's the point of having a younger brother around if you don't make him do the boring stuff for you? And though Khadija looks about ready to kill me, I see a small spark flash in Sadu's haggard eyes, and he snorts a laugh. Forcing a smile while trying to ignore the gnawing fear in the pit of my stomach, I reach into my pocket and hand Sadu our precious money. He'll be fine, Khadija whispers, but the muscles in my neck are tense and my hands are in fists by my sides as I pretend not to follow Seydu as he walks into the Daula Central Market. I can see the looks he's getting from the men and women there, worry, pitying, and I try to forget that he's my brother and see him as a stranger would, young, skinny, maimed, wrapped in torn, oversized clothes and filthy bandages. He looks like a beggar. I swallow my feelings like gravel and continue to follow him. Seydu doesn't look back. For a moment, he puts his hand on his hip, a pose that makes me even more aware of his missing left arm, and then he heads toward a tall, square woman who is slouching against a cart, talking to a skinny man. She's not the vendor I would have chosen. She looks hard and is very loud. I regret giving in to this idea. Seydu lists a little to the side as he walks up to the woman. I wonder when he'll find his new balance. Good morning, Sadu says politely. What are you selling? The woman and the man stop their conversation and look at him. Eggs, she says in a monotone, clearly not impressed. And corn. Go away, beggar boy. I only sell to customers. I don't give charity. On the farm, I would never have let any of the boys speak to Sadu that way. It's only Khadija's hand on my arm that keeps me from running over there. I'm a customer, says Seydu brightly. I don't know how he's not bothered by what she's saying, but his shiny smile is still in place. He pulls all of our money out of his pocket and holds it up. My auntie sent me to buy some things, but she said I could get myself lunch too. How much for three eggs? Three eggs just for you? She bellows a laugh. How are you so skinny when you eat like that? Maybe after I've eaten them, I won't be so skinny, Sadu jokes easily. For a split second, the woman and her friend stare at him. Sadu's smiling, open expression never wavers. Then, almost grudgingly, the woman tells him the price. Sadu haggles a little, but not so much that it seems rude, and they agree on a price that makes me cringe. It's not too far off the price for three eggs, but in almost a third of what we had, it's certainly more than I wanted to pay. Sadu asks her for help counting out the bills while he puts the eggs carefully in his pocket with his one hand. Another thing I would not have done. I would never have trusted a stranger to hold all of our money. A one-handed boy trying to put hard-boiled eggs in a shallow pocket is a fine show, and many people have stopped what they're doing 
and are now watching him. I feel twitchy with so many eyes on my brother. Once the eggs are safely tucked away, Sedu takes his change and thanks the woman politely. Then he turns with a big smile for the whole market and walks to a kindly-looking fat woman sitting beside a blanket covered in dry peanuts. He kneels in front of her in order to be at her eye level and starts chatting. A voice at my elbow distracts me. Your brother is so clever, Khadija says in an awed whisper. I tear my eyes from Sedu for a brief second to give her a look of disbelief. You've got to be kidding. He just paid more than full price for three eggs to that witch over there. Now it's her turn to stare at me. Don't you see what he did? When my silence answers for me, she goes on waving her hands around as she makes her point. He picked someone who was loud and stingy so that everyone would hear that he had money and wasn't a beggar. Then he paid a good price and was all open and trusting and sweet, smiling so much, being polite, handing her the money. Didn't you notice how everyone's expression softened when he was struggling to put those eggs in his pocket and she had to hold his money for him? He may have paid full price for those eggs, but I bet he doesn't pay full price for anything else. He melted every heart in this market. I turn in time to see a woman from two stalls away walk to where Sadu is still chatting with the fat peanut lady and pinch his cheeks. Within half an hour, Sadu is trotting out of the market with a bag of roasted peanuts, three hot ears of cooked corn, a small papaya, and a length of sugar cane balanced in the crook of his only arm. A small handful of leftover coins jingles in his other pocket. Khadija shoots me an I told you so look. I shrug and shuffle out of the market after him. One full meal of roasted corn and peanuts later, we all sit in the shade, sucking on the ends of the sugar cane I sliced open for us with my machete. We leave the three eggs in Sadu's pocket for later, and I have plans for the papaya. As the sweetness of the sugar cane floods my mouth, I finally feel the knot of uneasiness in my gut over sending Sadu into the market alone, unclenched. I squeeze his shoulder. I'm proud of you, I tell him. Slouched against the alley wall, exhausted and shaky with fatigue, Sadu beams. He knows he did well. I stare into his eyes and see a little of my brother come back. Maybe Khadija had a point, after all. Finally, I force myself to my feet and reach out to help the others stand. Let's go, I say. I want everyone to get walking while they still have sugar cane to chew on and are happy and not after all the food is gone and they all want to sleep. First, let's clean this up, Khadija says, pointing to Sadu's stump. I use my machete to cut the little papaya into thin slices, and we rebandage Sadu's arm, using the last of the gauze. I try not to think about what that means. <laughs>